Hello, my name is Dino Martinez, and I serve as one of the assistant directors and career consultants in the UAB Career Center. Thank you very much for joining me with this resume workshop video. Before we get started, I want to share with you what you can expect by watching this video. First, you'll be able to identify and effectively utilize the basic components of a resume. Second, you'll create an accomplishment statement using the APR method or formula, action plus problem or project plus results. Third, you'll articulate your understanding of the applicant tracking system or ATS and how you can tailor your resume using keywords. Ready? Let's get started. A lot of times we'll get students asking us when we do these workshops, how they can have their resume stand out, whether or not if they should use some of the templates that they find online or fonts, colorful graphics, anything to be able to have their resume stand out. Our response is to be able to make sure that you have good content in your resume because the HR professionals looking at your resume know what they're looking for and know good content regardless of the different type of fonts or graphics or columns that you put in your resume. So we're going to talk about the components that goes into a resume. So the basic components of most resumes is that make sure that you have your name and contact information. It's optional whether or not if you want to use a profile summary or summary statement, and we'll talk more about that later. Having your education on your resume and making sure you talk about your experiences. And experiences can be done in a lot of different ways. So let's talk about name and contact information. Now in your name and contact information, you can actually have several different formats. There's basically three pieces of information in your contact information that you should have. Your name, the telephone number that you prefer to use that you will pick up or answer if an employer is going to call, and an email address that's professional, yet is going to be an email address that you're going to pay attention to uh, in terms of inviting or accepting a potential employer's email messages. So we have a couple of examples here that you can see. As you notice, Terrell Johnson in his contact information actually has his physical address on, the, on his contact uh, information, which is completely fine. It's completely optional. As a matter of fact, our recommendation is that you don't necessarily need to have your physical, complete physical address on your resume. However, you may want to think about whether or not if you have the city and state, especially if you want to convey to the employer that you are local or that you're out of state, having that information on there would be helpful. But for the most part, you just need the name and telephone number because if the employer is excited about pursuing you as a candidate, they're only going to do one of two things. They're either going to call you or they're going to email you. But as you also see, Terrell has his contact information centered on the page. But if you look at Michael Roberts' example, Michael Roberts only has the name, telephone number, and email address, which is completely fine, but his is justified to the left. And then you can see Darlene Chang's, which Darlene Chang has city, state, telephone number, and email address. So all three of these examples are correct, and it doesn't matter whether or not if they're justified to the center, to the left. As a matter of fact, I've seen also seen contact information justified to the right, and I've also seen where the combination is that the name is justified to the left, but maybe the rest of the information is justified to the right. All those examples are correct, as long as you make sure you have minimally your name, telephone number, and email address. Now let's talk about the professional summary or summary statement. Now some people may say, well, I thought it was actually having a professional objective. Our recommendation is that you do not include an objective. For the most part, the employer already knows what your objective is when you submit your resume and can sum it up in three simple words. Get a job. Think about the profile summary or professional summary as an answer to this question. I have now narrowed down my choices to three people, you and two other candidates. Why should I hire you over the other two peers? And basically, the profiles on uh, the profile summary can be summed up 
and can answer that question perfectly. For example, use, looking at these examples, think about it this way. Well, I'm an undergraduate research scientist with experience in genetics and molecular biology. I have three plus years experience working in laboratories. I have experience writing and editing grants. Pretty much you're talking about what you bring to the table. Understanding out of all of these experiences, this is the best that I'm bringing to you. That's what should be in your profile summary or summary statement. To say summary statement because you can actually put it in paragraph form if you like. We recommend using bullets because bullets, one, are psychologically easier to read. A lot of times we get excited about we can read through bullet statements a lot faster than reading through paragraphs of information. So a lot of times you'll see um, resumes with bullet information as opposed to paragraphs. Either way is fine, but if you're putting together a profile summary or summary statement, make sure you're talking about what you bring to the table but also remember it's an optional element to the resume. It is not required, but don't use a professional or don't use a professional objective or of an objective statement. Now the next element that will come here after your contact information and if you decide to use a profile summary or um, profile statement is your education. Now here your education, you have a lot of different options in regards to providing your education. Now that you're a college student, for the most part, you're going to talk about where you're getting your degree, where the institution is located, the degree that you're getting, and the month and year that you either received the degree or achieving the degree. That's all we need. Okay, so here's a couple of examples. You see in that first example, we have University of Alabama at Birmingham. Right after it, Birmingham, Alabama. And then Bachelor of Arts in History expected graduation May 2022. That is formatted correctly. But then in the other example, you'll see Bachelor of Science, comma, Computer Science, May 2021. University of Alabama at Birmingham, and you'll notice that Birmingham, Alabama is now over to the right with the GPA of 3.8. This example is also formatted correctly as well. And then the third example with the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies, minor in English, graduation December 2020. All of these examples are formatted correctly, so it doesn't matter the order as long as you're consistent. So if you have an associate degree, you're also going to use the same format in regards to if you start off with your name first and uh, with the name of the institution first and then the degree, then you want to make sure that if you have another piece of education that you want to highlight, and you do the same thing, institution, degree. And you're gonna spell out the degree. Do not put B, BA or BS or MA or MS. It's Master of Science, Master of Art, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Art, in regards to putting it on the resume. Remember, the resume is a formal document. So you want to eliminate as much as possible using acronyms and shortcuts in regards to putting information on your resume. Don't assume that the reader understands and knows your history. As a matter of fact, the resume is about sharing and informing the employer about your history. Okay. Now we're going to move on, talk about experience. And even though experience is a required element in the resume, remember it's experience. It's not necessarily work experience. It could be all types of experiences in your resume and you can have them formatted in a lot of different ways. But you want to make sure that the experiences that you're going to share in your resume matches what the employer is looking for in regards to experience or skills or traits required to do the job. The resume is really a document that's targeted to that specific job or field, which is one of the reasons why one of the things that I want to make sure you understand is your resume that you put together is going to be tailored for every job you apply for. Okay, so as we move into experience, I'm going to share with you a couple of examples. In this first example, you'll see that we're just labeling it as just regular experience. And so the person here putting together their resume has UAB alumni relations. I would recommend that you put University of Alabama at Birmingham uh, alumni relations, and it's located in Birmingham, Alabama. Then the role is 
communicate, communication intern. The time frame, May, 19, uh, May 2019 to the present. And then you see bulleted statements there in regards to what they achieved or what they did while they were at that particular experience. Then you'll see Public Relations Society of America, UAB chapter, Birmingham, Alabama. The role was president. Time frame was April 2018 to May 2019. Now notice here, when you have a particular category, and this category is pretty broad, it just says experience. Everything in that category is listed in reverse chronological order, starting with the most recent experience first. I want to share with you another example. So here, in this particular example, the person is talking about their research experience. They want to highlight their research experience, possibly because they're applying for a research assistant position or the job that they're going into or they're applying for is heavily focused on research or research experiences or research skills. But same thing here. So they have a category research experience, University of Alabama at Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, research assistant, and you can see the time frame that they work, and then the bulleted statements in regards to what they achieved or what they, uh, or what they did in that particular position. Then you see the next position where they actually have, you know, the, the employer, the employer's address, the role that they were in, the time frame that they were in. And then you see volunteer experience is separate from research experience. So there again, they're now listing kind of like their volunteer experience because Either they've done their research and found out that the employer highly values research uh, as well as valuing volunteerism, service. And so the person may want to highlight the fact that not only do I have research experience, but I also have service experience as well. And that's why I'm a good fit for your position or your job. Think about the resume talking to the employer that way. But there again, you can see because they started a different category called volunteer experience, then they, the countdown in regards to that reverse chronological order of your experiences starts all over again. Another example here, where we have someone who's interested in going into education, talks about their classroom experience and the fact that they were a student teacher, had the bullet points in regards to what they did during that experience. And here, one of the things that you'll notice is that they have it formatted pretty much all in one line the role as a student teacher, the employer, where the employer was located, and then the dates in terms of that employment or that particular experience. Then they have a different category that says related experience, where they're talking about, again, the role that they were in, the employer or the location of the experience, and then the time frame, and then the bulleted statements in regards to what they actually did while they were there. So there's a lot of different ways that you can format your experience. Our last example here is that we can see this person just wanted to list maybe their relevant experiences. So maybe this person may have actually in the course of their undergraduate career, they may have had seven or eight different part-time jobs or part-time experiences, but they only wanted for this particular job that they were applying for, they only wanted to focus in on, on their most relevant experiences and not share all because if they were to try to do that, it may take more than one page to be able to talk about their experiences. So they talk about their relevant experiences as an IT, uh, IT intern. They have the time frame. They have the employer's name, ABC company. They have the location. And then they have a couple of bullets uh, in regards to what they achieved or what they did or what they have done during that experience. And they have it listed in they have those experiences listed in chronological order. You see again in terms of staying with the format. They started off with the role in terms of the IT um, personal computer support intern. In their next experience, they talk about their role as now teaching assistant, the time frame, and then the employer in terms of UAB um, computer science department and the location. So they they had it formatted in regards to their role and then the employer in each one of those experiences. So and it doesn't matter. You can actually start off with the employer, the employer's location, um, or the employer and the employer location, and then the role, and then the time frame. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent throughout your resume in terms of how you have that formatted and laid out. So now we're going to talk about accomplishment statements. 
these are those bulleted statements that's in the resume that you are trying to share with the employer how you are qualified and or what brings you know what do you bring to the table how have your experiences shaped and prepared part of who you are based on what you have done in your previous experiences and here we talked about it before in regards to the takeaways this is where in terms of accomplishment statements we have this formula that's called action plus problem or project and that's the p action the a in, in that apr formula is action then we talk about the p or problem that you either worked on or solved or the project that you worked on and then your results so this is a very important part of the resume because now you're trying to convey your experiences as far as what you actually accomplished what did you do or what you did in those experiences that makes you a viable candidate for the position or the scholarship or the opportunity that you that you are applying for an example of this can look like coordinating that is the action the problem project five fundraising events for local homeless shelters and then the r the results raising over five thousand dollars 20 percent over the goal so instead of saying responsible for coordinating fundraising events which i see a lot of students do in terms of just reporting what they're responsible for using an apr formula you actually stand out in regards to talking about what you actually accomplished coordinated is the action the problem or project here is five fundraising events for local homeless shelters and the results raising over five thousand dollars 20 percent over a goal so now we have an accomplishment statement that reads coordinated by fundraising events for local homeless shelters raising over five thousand dollars 20 percent over the goal compare that to saying responsible for coordinating fundraising events and i'm sure that i convince you that actually using the apr formula in your resume can help make your resume stand out and be a much stronger and more effective way of telling the employer about your qualifications. Now I want to talk to you about the applicant tracking system. It's a piece of software that more companies and agencies are using to mitigate the volume of resumes that they're getting from people who are applying for entry level positions or all types of positions actually. So sometimes employers can anticipate the fact that they may receive hundreds, if not thousands of resumes for one particular job. And that professional HR individual doesn't have enough time to actually scan through or read through all the applications. Actually, the information out there about the national average that the HR individual is going to spend looking at your resume for the first time is, believe it or not, six to 15, not minutes, but seconds. So many companies, agencies, and employers are using an applicant tracking system, the software. So when you upload your resume to the company's website, there is software that's scanning your resume to try to determine whether or not if you meet their expectations or not. So when you upload your resume, the ATS or applicant tracking system software is actually scanning your resume to find out whether or not if you're using the same keywords they identified in their job posting to find out whether or not if you're a viable candidate. So as you can see in this example here, in this particular job posting, we identified keywords in the resume. So I tell people, Think about it as going through and you're reading text, you're studying for an exam, and you're highlighting what you believe are the important parts of the passages in that chapter that will be covered in the exam. You want to do the same thing for a job posting. You want to identify what you believe are the key words, are the important words or phrases that might be, that they may be looking for when they look at your resume. Or another way to take a look at it is to make sure that you're using the same type of language, the same type of words. Other tips and suggestions that we want to make sure that you understand. The national data that's out there or the best practices in regards to the length of the resume states that it's basically one page for every 10 years of experience. So keep that in mind. Now, some positions and some jobs, like especially in education, may be a bit more forgiving where you can actually submit a two-page resume. Now, in terms of, so that's the length. Margins. We generally tell people no less than half inch 
top and bottom, and no less than seven tenths of an inch left and right. That way your resume doesn't look like you're actually trying to cram all this information on one page. We also suggest not using what's referred to as a decorative font or, or a serif font. Use a non-serif or non-decorative font. Believe it or not, Times New Roman is a serif font. It's also an outdated font. Use something that's a bit more clean or crisp, something like Arial or Calibri or Century New Gothic. But don't use Times New Roman or any other type of decorative font that may be in your word processing program. Using Arial or Calibri, most word processing programs, including those um, by the employer, potential employer that you're applying for, will have pretty much those type of fonts. And when you upload your resume, would be read correctly. We want to make sure that you also avoid listing obvious skills and traits that most employers may assume you should come with. So for example, in your profile summary, or if you have a skill section in your resume, don't list that you're hardworking, detailed oriented, you have good time management skills, unless of course the employer is asking for those skills, don't list it. It may be already assumed. I would assume that if I have a position out there, if I'm a potential employer, anybody who is applying for a job in my company is hardworking, is timely, knows how to prioritize, and maybe even proficient in Microsoft Word. They're all college students. As a matter of fact, UAB gives every college student access to Office 365. So saying you're proficient in Word while most college students are writing papers using Word really doesn't help separate you from the rest of the pack. So avoid using skills and traits that most employers will assume you should already have. So those are some of the resume tips and suggestions that we have. If you want more of those, log on to Handshake. When you log into Handshake, click on Career Center, and in that Career Center, you'll see, once you click on Career Center, you'll see three tabs. One that says Appointments, Resources, and Surveys. Click on that middle tab that says Resources. When you scroll down, you'll be able to find some more information, some more resources about building a resume. Thank you very much for taking the time to look at this video. Hopefully, we have helped you with your building your resume. For more information, Many of you are already enrolled in our Career Center Canvas course. One of the modules in that Canvas course is this information about building a resume. So look that up as well. But remember, you also have the resource library in Handshake. When you click on the Career Center, that middle tab, you'll have appointments, resources, and surveys. You're clicking on that middle tab that says resources, and you can have access to our resource library. So we have a lot of information about building a resume and so much more about our services. Take advantage of that. That's available to you 24 seven. Thank you again for watching this video.